Antarctica is the highest, driest, coldest and windiest continent on Earth. Its enormous ice sheet is up to four kilometres thick and holds enough water that if it completely melted, sea level would rise by around 60 metres. Our Earth is warming and as it continues to warm, these vast reservoirs of frozen water will melt and contribute to global sea level rise, both this century and in the centuries beyond. I'm a paleoclimatologist, that means I research Earth's past climate. I'm particularly interested in how the polar ice sheets responded to past warmer climates and how this affects changes in global sea level. You could say it's a bit like looking back to the future. I use knowledge of our past to improve our understanding of our future, and a future that will have a significantly warmer climate. I'll come back to the Antarctic ice sheet and sea level rise soon, but let's first look at global warming. Our planet regulates its temperature by the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the key one, and even though it forms less than 1% of the gases, it is important because it has powerful radiative properties and resides in the atmosphere for the longest. Once you put it there, 20% of it will still be there after 1,000 years. It traps long-wave radiation, or heat, emitted from the Earth's surface. This is known as the greenhouse effect, and without it, our planet would be uninhabitable for humans. For the last 10,000 years, carbon dioxide levels have been around 300 parts per million. And on average, Earth's surface temperature has been a very pleasant 14 degrees Celsius. This time is often referred to as the Goldilocks period. Not too cold, not too hot, but just right for our species to flourish. And this is why human civilization has flourished. The problem is that since the Industrial Revolution, humans have directly contributed to a 30% increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, to levels of 400 parts per million that have not been seen on our planet for three million years. Now the science is very clear on two points, and they are undisputed. The world is warming. The world is warming because of us, the use of fossil fuels and carbon dioxide we have put in the atmosphere. The latest climate change assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made the statement that the human influence on the climate system is clear, with 99% certainty. This climate change report also says that if we keep burning fossil fuels at the rate we are currently doing, and we stay on this path, then by the end of the century, the world will be four to five degrees Celsius warmer. Computer climate models show that to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we must restrict global warming to less than two degrees Celsius above present. Okay, so what happens if we can't slow down global warming? What if we continue to burn the coal, oil and gas at the same rate we are currently doing? What does a world that is warmer than two degrees look like? And how do we know that these computer models of our future climate are correct? There is another approach scientists take. So now I want to take you back in time using my expertise as a geologist to the last time our planet had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to a time when it was on average three degrees warmer. And I will address the question, what happened to the Antarctic ice sheet? And what were the implications for rising sea levels? These sort of questions get me really excited. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning, and it's why I became an Earth scientist. So let me take you back in my geologic time machine, three million years ago, to planet Earth. In fact, it looked pretty much like it does today, with a large ice sheet on Antarctica, a smaller ice sheet on Greenland, and with continents and oceans roughly in the same place they are today. And an atmosphere, as we've already said, was 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. So what did Earth's temperature look like? Well, on average, it was three degrees warmer, but in the polar regions, it was six to seven degrees warmer. This phenomenon is called polar amplification, and it should start to ring alarm bells because that's where 70% of the world's fresh water is locked up in the ice sheets. So in 2006, I led an international team of scientists to Antarctica to drill a hole beneath the ice into the layers of sedimentary rocks below the sea floor to find out what happened to Antarctica and its ice sheets three million years ago when the world was warmer. My time machine is in fact a drill rig. We geologists read the layers of rock preserved under the sea floor like pages in a history book. We're able to decipher a huge amount of information. For example, how warm was the ocean? How warm was the atmosphere? What was growing on land? What was living in the ocean? When did the ice sheets expand? And when was it they collapsed? The results of our drilling were quite surprising. 
For the first time we had found evidence that three million years ago, when our world's climate was as warm as it soon will be, large parts of the Antarctic ice sheet had collapsed. In the Ross Sea, there was no ice, and in fact, the sea temperatures were up to five degrees warmer, whereas today, of course, they are around freezing. This warm Ross Sea was a hive of life, a hotspot of ocean productivity, and there were extensive marine algal blooms. The fossil remains of those marine algae, or diatoms as they are known, dominated the sediments we recovered in the cores that represented those times when the ice sheet had melted and the climate was warmer. Armed with this new information on the climate, we then teamed up with the world's leading computer modelers of ice sheets. And we asked the question, how much ice disappeared from Antarctica on a continental scale? Although we had good information from the Ross Sea, we wanted to know the implications of what we had discovered for the entire ice sheet. And this is where modelers come in. But without our geological climate constraints, they would not know if their models were working correctly. So together we showed with the ice sheet models and the data that the smaller West Antarctic ice sheet had completely melted and was replaced by ocean. And that parts of the larger East Antarctic ice sheet melted as well, contributing up to about 15 metres of global sea level rise. Now, we have to add to that the Greenland ice sheet, which also melted and contributed an additional seven metres. So by examining the past, we get a better understanding of our planet's future and what potentially might happen as our climate continues to warm. But before we go to the future, let's now consider what's happening to Antarctica today. A fact that surprises many people is that 93% of the heat from human global warming has actually gone into the ocean. Global warming is ocean warming. And a very large proportion of that heat has gone into the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. Consequently, the warming ocean around Antarctica is causing the ice sheet to thin and retreat, especially where the warming is the greatest, along the coast of West Antarctica. Some parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet are thought to be on the verge of unstoppable collapse, and once underway, may melt in a runaway fashion. This is because once you warm the ocean, it takes a long time for it to cool down again, even if you do remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the IPCC, in their latest report, have made a prediction of up to one metre of global sea level rise by the end of this century. Now, one metre may not sound a lot, but around 200 million people live within one vertical metre of present day sea level. However, there is large uncertainty in what the Antarctic ice sheets might do in the future, especially if they behave unpredictably. Sea level rise could be much higher than one metre. For example, the latest simulations suggest that Antarctica might contribute an additional 50 centimetres to global sea level by the end of the century, over and above the current estimate of one metre, if we do not limit global warming. Of equal concern is that if the world warms more than two degrees, we will be committed to many more metres of sea level rise in the centuries to come. This model suggests up to 10 metres in 1,000 years. To keep Earth's temperature rise to less than two degrees of global warming, we can continue business as usual for a few more years with our carbon dioxide emissions. But we soon need to peak out and then we will have to go cold turkey on fossil fuels. That is to reduce all emissions to zero by the end of the century. To do this, we must transition from fossil fuels to renewables and alternative technologies, such as solar, wind, wave, nuclear. We will need to decarbonize our industries, our economies, and our society. This is the intergenerational challenge, and I'm sure that our children will not be thanking us for leaving them with this problem. But what I want to say to our young people is you have a very exciting scientific and technological challenge ahead of you. The science tells us that there is a pathway that prevents dangerous climate change. So right now, we are determining the future shape of our coastlines for centuries to come. We have the power to choose whether or not we will have to deal with some of the worst consequences of climate change, such as extreme events, storms, droughts, floods, heat waves, and wildfires. Science is a powerful tool. It arms us with information about our future. It enables us to choose the future we want. It allows us to adapt to a future we may not want. We must rise to the challenge. We must be the best scientists, the best engineers, the best decision makers we can. We can take on this challenge. The future is in our hands.